All right. Thanks for coming on, Corey. So the way that I got to know you was uh, I'd been working on a novel. It was actually the third novel I ever worked on, but this one actually ended up getting published in part from what I learned from you. But um, the I had always had this idea in my head as somebody who read every book on writing that I could get my hands on that, you know what, there's really no secrets. And then I started learning from you and it's like, oh, there are some secrets. There's things that I had never heard of before that were incredibly crucial to me being able to go from somebody who had, let's call it like rough, raw talent and passion to, I know somewhat what I'm doing and I know what my strengths and weaknesses are and can build from it. And so I'm curious as to how did you even end up becoming a writing teacher? How did I be, end up becoming a writing teacher? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, I was at UCLA Film School as a student, uh, MFA student, and I was really lucky to break in the business. Um, I sold the project to Ridley Scott and it was in the front page of Variety. And so I started getting hired by studios and then UCLA asked if I would teach and it sounded fun. And I think at that point, um, I'd never been a writer before. So I was dealing for the first time with um, loneliness, you know, writing at home and uh, feeling disconnected from people because I tend to be more of a social person. So when you say, I said, you want to teach? I was like, sure. Like it never occurred to me, do I, am I capable of teaching? It was just like, well, they think I am and it sounds fun, so I'll do it. And it, and it was really bizarre because the first time I taught, um, it was a classroom that 18 months earlier, I was a student in that very classroom. So I remember coming and sitting and everyone was looking at me and I was kind of looking behind me like, where's this teacher? And it was, it was really surreal, but, but I love doing it and I'll forever be grateful that UCLA was crazy enough to think I could do it. And so that's so interesting. I, I guess my question would be, so how did you kind of develop your ideas and maybe this will come out as we talk about specifically what some of your ideas were, but uh, I, I would be shocked if maybe you walked in and came out with uh, all of the stuff that you're teaching today. Was right. it mostly trial and error or? Yeah. Did you well, so I think I do what a lot of people do. I think that in the beginning I taught a lot of the way that I was taught, you know, in film school. And then I started to see, advantages, but I also see a lot of disadvantages. And, um, you know, one of the things that really became clear to me early on as a teacher is that everyone who, every writer has inherent strengths, weaknesses, and blind spots. And blind spots are key because those are the weaknesses that we don't know we have. And someone has to point them out to us. And then the key is how do you turn weaknesses into strengths? Because most writers will have an inherent process that plays to their strengths and hides their weaknesses and they hit a ceiling they can't get past. So what I was trying to figure out is how do I help people see what their weaknesses are? And then what are actual practical exercises or practical training to turn weaknesses into strengths? And, and a lot of really smart people got excited by that and helped me. So it would, uh, as much as I like to say, I sat in a cave and it all came to me. There was a lot of collaboration and then what happened is the writer strike happened a few years later. So I was teaching like once a year and mainly just to give something back and for fun. It wasn't a serious pursuit. I was writing was, you know, my career, but then there was a writer strike. And so for six months or so, I couldn't be writing. And, and I loved teaching and my wife was always encouraging me to really go deep into it. So I invited some of my students and said, okay, here's the proposition. You know, and I explained the strengths, the weaknesses and the whole thing. I said, here's the proposition. You come to my house once a week for three hours and we will do this for the next year and you will pay me. And I will endeavor to figure out how to train each of you in a way that you can turn your weaknesses into a strength. Oh, and here's the disclaimer. I have no idea if I can do this. <laughs> But if you're game to try, so am I. And it was an, I, I was really fortunate to have amazing people and it became a collaboration and they, they put as much thought into it as I did. And it was a lot of trial and error and um, probably two thirds error to one third successes. But 
once that happens and you start to see the patterns, you start to realize what works and what doesn't. And I'm really proud of, of there was 10 people who did this. One of them dropped out because of a, a wife got pregnant and just life changed. Of the nine who remain, six of them are currently professional working writers. Um, that's like 68% or I, my math might be off. It, film schools have about a two, one and a half to 2% success rate. And just real clear, I'm not saying that that astronomical success rate was because I'm such a brilliant teacher. It was because we collectively really started to find a training process that works. Yeah. And one of the things that was revelatory to me, so I do a lot of nonfiction teaching and I modeled a lot of what I do today on what I learned from your class. And in particular, it was this, which is that usually people focus on here's the process is very dogmatic, like do this, do this, or just very broad principles. You know, this is the hero's journey or something. And I think all of that can be valuable, but you focus on very definite skill sets and then tools to develop those skill sets, which is very practical. But the, the starting point for how, what grabbed me and how I got interested in you was I, I remember I was brushing my teeth and I was listening to a podcast and there is this guy talking on like that, making this point about you got to find your blind spots and said that, uh, you know, I find that there's kind of two kinds of writers. They're strong in this way versus that way. And I don't, uh, and I'll let you explain what that distinction is. But to me, this was the foundation of everything I've learned uh, from you since then. Well, um, thank you. And that was really the singular key concept that evolved in that year that I talked about that informed everything. And basically um, the idea is not all writers, but most writers tend to work from a home base, from a strong place. And there are writers who work from a more conceptual place. And then there are writers who work from a more intuitive place. Now we all have access to the, our conceptual and our intuitive sides, but most writers tend to work primarily from one side versus the other. So I would call people who work from a conceptual side, conceptualists, people who work from an intuitive side, intuitives. And each kind of writer has inherent strengths and inherent weaknesses. So conceptual writers, they tend to work outside in. They tend to, uh, when you ask them, what did you start with? It's usually an idea, a theme, a, a story ending, a story beginning, a premise. And they're very focused on always having interesting things happening in their writing because they're very aware that the purpose of writing is ultimately to engage other people. So they're very focused on the audience and they're very focused on delivering for the audience. And what tends to happen is their real weaknesses in characters and dialogue and emotional resonance because that's they're coming at it from a conceptual place and their characters will often feel created to serve the story because they usually were created to serve the story. And you don't, while there's all these interesting things happening, we often aren't as interested as we wanna be in many ways because we're not really feeling anything in many ways because they weren't really feeling that much when they were writing. And so these writers are great at uh, coming up with big ideas and concepts and having really smart, often overly complicated structure um, and all these interesting things happening. It's just, we're not as interested as we need to be. And on the other side of the uh, table are the intuitive writers and they don't invent their characters. Uh, they don't decide on their characters. They discover their characters. I don't know if you can hear my golden retriever barking in the background, but he loves this stuff. <laughs> uh, very, he's a very intuitive dog. And um, my cat will very likely jump up in this desk before we're done. So intuitive writers excel at, at characters because when you read their work, you feel like you are in the company of real people and they have unique voices and you can feel what they feel. And these characters are forever in search of a compelling story that they can never find because the intuitive brain, it doesn't, to step back, the conceptual brain is very aware of other people and the objective of writing something that is compelling for other people. That's not how the intuitive brain works. The intuitive brain is only focused on the here and now and what is authentic. What are you authentically feeling? What authentically is interesting to you as a person? So it's, it's a much more personalized form of writing. 
And so they're writing in a way that is authentic to them, compelling to them, just isn't that interesting and compelling to other people usually. And so most people practice creative disintegration, which is they play to their strengths and they hide their weaknesses. So like the metaphor, and I'm sure you've heard this as a tennis player, who's got a great forehand, but a weak backhand. So they're gonna try to play as much backhand and not play a lot of back, uh, play a lot of forehand, not play a lot of backhand. But if you were playing them in a tournament, you would be forcing them as much as possible to defend from the backhand. What creative integration would be is, okay, come work with me if I were a tennis coach, which I'm not. And for the next three months, you're only going to work on your backhand. You're, you're not allowed to ever do forehand to develop your backhand to be as strong as your forehand. Then I'll release you back into competitions and you'll be unbeatable, or at least you'll be the best tennis player that you can be. So what I do in working with writers is endeavor them to, if they're conceptual writers, turn that part off and work from a pure intuitive place, which will be very disconcerting and uncomfortable probably. And specific skill sets until their intuitive side is as strong as their conceptual side. Then comes the challenging but transformative part of learning how to integrate the two so they're working in concert so that they have the best possible character, dialogue, emotional resonance in service of the strongest stories that will be the most interesting to other people. And it's the exact opposite, but same for conceptualists. I'm sorry, for intuitives, which is turn off the intuitive side and de develop the conceptual side to be rock star strong and then how to integrate the two. And the thing we know from brain science is that the conceptual part of the brain and the intuitive part of the brain cannot both be on at the same time. Now you can go back and forth so quickly that it feels like they're, you know, you're firing on all cylinders, but, but for physiological reasons, they can't both be on at the same time. So you have to literally learn how to turn one part off, one part of your creativity off, to focus on the other part, to develop it, to make it as strong as your primary part and then work together through integration. And that's how people will finally become not only the best writer that they can be, but they'll actually become an even better writer than they knew they could be. Well, and I remember when I heard it, I mean, I instantly realized, okay, I'm on the conceptual side. I'm like, I don't feel like I have permission to put anything down unless it's interesting, unless there's a real strong plot to it. And I, I, I wasn't horrible at character. So for a second, I was like, oh, maybe I've got this pegged. And then what I realized as I looked at my novel, I was like, well, no, there, it, it's definitely not a cardboard character, but at very crucial points, she would just be doing stuff because the plot demanded and it sort of just fell apart. It felt contrived and things like that. And so when I started going through this, what I found was it was very scary and there was a lot of resistance I had. And, I, and I'm a big believer. And if you find somebody with a working system, trust them and go through it. But I really wanted to make excuses for why I don't have to go through all the hard work that Corey's telling me to develop the intuitive side. Um, and so what is the, what's your theory, if you have one, and why it's so hard to kind of say, all right, I'm, I'm going to tie that arm back. I'm going to set aside my strengths and work on the weaknesses. Because I'll answer that, but let me sort of back up to your experience, which is you're the kind, you were the kind of writers that I worry about in so much as there are writers who are really strong conceptual or really strong intuitive, and they have very limited access to the other side. I don't worry about them because they're going to know that, like their writing is going to demonstrate that. But you were someone who was inherently a conceptualist, but you had actually strong access to the intuitive side for a conceptual writer. And right. so then therefore your writing, um, you have pretty interesting characters and dialogue, not, not as compelling as it could be, but pretty interesting in service of a really smart structure. And I worry about those writers because they can get a lot of praise and, and it can look like everything's going well, but nothing's actually happening for them and no one's picking up their books or their scripts. And it's just, well, I'm not in the right place at the right time. And if I keep doing the same, no, the thing is, is you're good. 
you're not good enough yet. And so um, I think the reason it's so terrifying, um, and I was the conceptualist who had to do this training and um, it was beyond terrifying for me. It was, it was literally, this is impossible and I will not do it. It's, it's a, it has to come down to our value systems. And so I'll just speak for myself as a natural conceptual writer, the whole point of writing is to create something that's entertaining for other people. And the great fear of writing is that it will be judged and therefore I will be judged. And I'm not saying that's necessarily true, but that was my truth. That's how I felt about it. So therefore make sure that everything you write is really good and really interesting. Um, and so then when someone says, okay, let that go. And now work from a pure intuitive place where it doesn't matter what other people think, just write from your truth and what's authentic to you. That not only is it, did that feel pointless to the conceptual brain, it felt unsafe. It felt dangerous because if I completely uncensor myself and write whatever I want, what might people think? What might I write? What, what might I reveal about myself? What, like this is, this is dangerous. And, um, you know, cause it's like when I used to date, um, you know, if it's a first date, I try to be on my best behavior. I tried to be well-groomed. I tried to be my most charming self. I try to come off in a positive way. Um, that's what the conceptual writer is doing when they're writing. So it, it, it's disconcerting and it doesn't feel safe. And for an intuitive writer, it's, um, it's even harder because what I'm asking an intuitive writer is to take everything they love about writing, this personal connection, these, these true people that they, the friends they hang out with, all of this stuff, the reason they're writers and turn it off to learn this other critical aspect of writing. And to an, to an intuitive writer, it, it, it can feel like I'm killing the part of me that is why I wanna write and they may never come back, which is not true, but that's how they'll feel. So it's, it, what I always tell everybody, you, I'm sure you heard me say this, Don, is when people hear about creative innovation and the potential of where it can take their writing, everybody's so excited, you know, and they'll sign up for the workshop. And the first day of the workshop is like Christmas. It's like, yes, let's do this. I can't wait. And then once we start the process, they hate the workshop and they hate me and they hate this because it is inherently challenging and painful in the beginning. Well, and I think one of the things that conceptualists will do is try to turn the intuitive work. So like, if you think about characters, all right, how can I break this into a conceptual format? Like, what are the ingredients? Like, oh, if maybe I have them like have a quirky hobby, that's unusual, right? So there's- right. Uh, but and that wonder... always feels forced. And, the, and that's the, that is the person who won't turn off their conceptual brain. And what the conceptual brain is really good at is trying to figure out how to cheat the system. Or what the conceptual brain is really good at is, I don't like this question, so I'll answer a different question. Mm -hmm. The conceptual brain is really smart at that. So maybe this is a conceptual question, but is, what can we say about what does make characters believable, interesting, real aside from the process that gives rise to it? So integration. So first off, the best characters don't seem written. They don't seem artificial. They don't seem like, oh, they've got a quirky hobby that someone decided to give them, right? They seem like actual real people, actual real people. And in, in reading, I feel like I am hanging out with real people and they are unique and dimensional and all of that. And that comes from, all of that is created intuitively, not conceptually. See, the thing is a lot of writers who struggle with characters and dialogue and have a lot of voices in their head about why that's the case or what to do about it. They're just using the wrong tool. It's like trying to pound nails into wood with a straw. It's not going to work or trying to drink a milkshake through a hammer. It's not gonna work, you need the right tool. And the conceptual brain is the wrong tool. So, so it starts with real actual characters. That's the intuitive side. But if you just stay there, 
it's like um, I had four of my best friends that I grew up with come to visit me in LA a few years ago. And we just spent the weekend. We didn't really do anything. We went golfing. None of us can golf. We played arcade video games. We drank beer. We talked. We just, and it was the most enthralling two days of my life. I love these guys. I haven't seen them forever. I just love hanging out with them. If someone had filmed those two days, do you want to watch it? Do you want to watch me hanging out with my friends for two days doing absolutely nothing? No, it would be, it would be so boring for you. But because I love these people, nothing interesting has to happen. And I just love being with them. That's the life of an intuitive writer. Now, you take that and then you learn how to harness it into a compelling story that showcases those characters. So you start to realize you're not just looking for interesting things to happen. You're looking for interesting things for those characters. And you start to understand what situations to put those characters through, to let the characters do what they do. And ultimately what happens is you learn how to write from a true pitch perfect authentic space where the best TV shows, the best novels or short stories or the best movies, what they have in common is you never see the writer's hand, you never see the hand of the writer. Everything that happens seems organic and truthful. Not like someone's telling a story, you're just a fly on the wall going through this experience with the characters and yet it's never boring. It's, it just grabs you and holds you. That requires conceptual design in service of the characters. And to do that, one must be conceptually a rock star, intuitively a rock star, and then understand how to integrate the two where they work together. And that is a series of tools and training. So that's, that's the answer I would give. So aside from focusing too much on your existing strengths and not enough in your weaknesses, are, is there any other areas that you see writers worry too much about or focus too much about or areas where they're just not paying enough attention? Yeah, I mean, so I work with novelists but I primarily work with screenwriters and TV writers. And, um, and I think in, in any of these regards, if you step back, there's, there's two objectives you're gonna to have to solve. You're gonna to have to build the right, the right kind of material and you're gonna to have to get access. You're gonna to have to get the right people to read it and you know, meet with you. And most writers, understandably, but too much time and energy trying to figure out the right access and not enough on the right material. So, you know, it's, it's all about being in the right place at the right time with the right project. But for most writers, they're going to spend their whole life trying to be in the right place at the right time with the wrong project. So I think it's, it's really about learning how to at least become the best writer that only you can be and what makes you unique, but how do you harness that in, in the strongest way? And ideally how to become an even better writer than you knew you could be. I mean, that's the greatest gift anyone can give you as a writer is to help hold you to a standard that you didn't even know you could achieve and to help you get there. And if you focus on that and you can get there, the access part or the career part takes care of itself for the most part. That's actually the easier part. But too well, many people are, I'm sorry, go on. Well, I was just going to say, that's part of what I took away that sometimes I would hear you talk and it sounded just so easy to break into Hollywood or by implication, you know, get a novel published. Um, and then other times it would seem like this is the hardest thing in the world, but I think it comes down to that point. It's that if you actually are able to build your skill set to the point that you're writing at a high level with no weaknesses, it's not exactly easy in the sense that like getting, you know, a job at McDonald's would be easy, but it's not a pure roll of the dice. Like you're bringing something that's in high demand to the table, no, it, but it, it, there's it, one, it just, I was one last part I was going to add to that, but there is a caveat to that, which is I found it really helpful when you describe not the, how do you meet the right people, but what is this universe looking for? What are people in Hollywood looking for? There's a certain kind of script. And I think that's, it's true though, a little bit different in fiction writing that publishers are looking for certain kinds of novels. And that's really important to know so that you can use your skill set in the service of something that's actually in demand. Yeah. And this probably doesn't apply to fiction or to novel writers, but 
in screenwriting and TV writing, um, a big mistake is thinking my objective is to write a script and then sell it and launch my career. Um, that's not the objective. The objective is to write some scripts that then launch a career. And for most writers, what that means is demonstrating these skill sets, perhaps in a very unique script that ultimately might not line up in that moment with what the marketplace is looking for. But that's okay because people will read that script and go, wow, I have never read anything like that before. It is so unique. And then they will want to meet with you and they'll want to work with you and they'll want to hear your ideas. They can buy a pitch and hire you to write it or they'll want to staff you on their TV shows. So I wrote a script and nobody could buy it because there was a, it, about three weeks before the script went out to market, um, someone, um, some idiot, and I don't mean that sincerely, no, some very smart person uh, sold a novel that had a somewhat similar concept. I didn't think it was that similar, but the industry thought it was similar enough that because people were bidding for the novel rights to a movie, no one wanted my script. And I felt like God hates me, you know, and I'm so unlucky. Although as I met more and more writers with the same story, I realized, ah, God doesn't hate me. God just hates writers. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened is that writing sample got me meetings, including at Ridley Scott's company. And then I, I sold a pitch. Um, or Matthew Weiner wrote a script for Mad Men at a time when that was too New York, too dark, two period, and nobody was doing period pieces. That script was DOA in terms of no one would buy it. But everyone's like, I've never read a script like this. This is amazing. And he had all these meetings. And David Chase, who was, uh, just came off the first season of Sopranos, which was the creative center of the universe back in 1999, um, didn't have a slot for a staff writer, but read the script and created a slot for this and hired Matthew off of the spec script at Mad Men. And then Matthew wrote on Sopranos for the rest of the season or the rest of the series. And I believe won two Emmys. And then when that was over and people said, well, what do you want to do next? He goes, well, I have the script called Mad Men. And they're like, sounds brilliant. Let's do this. <laughs> so the point is, and this might be different for novelists, but for TV writers and screenwriters, you're not trying to write something to sell it. You're trying to write something that is unique, that only you could have written, that is pitch perfect authentic, we talked about with amazing characters and story all integrated. Because if you do that, I guarantee you, um, you will sell it if you're in the right place at the right time. And that's just as a matter of luck. But here's what is no luck, is that if you do that, people wanna meet you and they'll wanna work with you. And if you keep doing that, someone will eventually work with you. And that could be being staffed on a TV show. It could mean like I did selling a pitch for a feature or getting a feature assignment. You know, someone has to write Toy Story 9 or Wonder Woman 17, or someone has to um, adapt this graphic novel that they're doing. And, or there's a variety of ways that you can make a living as a writer. The key is, it's really simple. Just get enough people wanting to work with you it all take care of itself. So a big mistake that writers make is they're trying to write what they think could sell, what, what is selling now. Be aware of all the false prophets and experts telling you what to write. First off, I guarantee you, if you hear anybody say, this is what everyone's buying in Hollywood, it's at least three months old information. And, and let's say that's not the case. Let's say your next door neighbor is an agent at WME. And she tells you right now, everyone is looking for this kind of a script. And you're like, great, let me go home and write it. By the time you got fade in, they're on to something else. So you'll never win that game. Now let's take it a crazy step further, Don. Let's say you've got a crystal ball and you know exactly what people are gonna be looking for to buy three months or four months from now. Still a mistake to write that because you're not trying to sell something. You're trying to write the one script that only you could write and a script that we've never seen before that just blows people away. Because what you want to do is you want to get people meeting with you. You want to create relationships with people who want to hire you. 
And let's say at the end of that, all those meetings, no one's hired you. And people say, ah, I'm back to square one. They don't understand you're not back to square one. You're on square three, square four, which is, yeah, you're going to go write another script. And people are like, oh, I got to go write another script. I don't want to do that. Then it's like, why are you a writer? That's the job. <laughs> right? Well, yeah, what do you, all right. So you write another script, but now it's not being read by readers. It's being read by people who are fans and people who want to work with you. And if you impress them a second time and then a third time, that's when they'll hire you because then they're like, you're consistent. You're a pro. I can count on you. I don't know anyone who has written three amazing scripts who isn't working professionally as a writer, especially, well, the pandemic put a kibosh in things, but pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, this is, there's never been a better time to work in TV. There's, there's more shows being produced than ever before. There's more money being spent than ever before. This is, it's not the golden age. It's the, what's better, the, the platinum. platinum. Yeah, the platinum age. Although I don't know, I always thought Diamond was pretty good, but anyway. Um, what is writing advice that everybody believes that you think is wrong? And I'm sure you probably have a very long list. But yeah, how much time? Just whatever happens to come to mind. Uh, well, yeah, so this isn't necessarily like, uh, well, um, well, two, two things. The first thing is, and I, I don't know again, how pervasive this is in novels, but in, the, in it used to be about 10 years ago, what the marketplace was looking for was take a proven idea, like, like a successful movie or TV show and do it with a twist. So it's like this movie, it's like The Hangover, but with women. It's like The Hangover, but with dogs. It's like, it's like, um, flea bag, but with a teenager girl or whatever. And that was very in demand. And also what was in demand was paradigm formula driven scripts about 10 to 15 years ago. Everything's changed. That's a long story why, but everything's changed and nobody will read those scripts and nobody wants to work with those writers. And you need to write something unique and original. And so there's a lot of advice because there's a lot of books and programs that are outdated. They are offering what was good advice 12 years ago, but what they're doing now is training writers to fight a, a war that ended 10 years ago. And I know so many agents and managers and um, they've literally told their people, if you read a script that is following a formula or a paradigm or you know, following this book or this book, or is something common with a twist, and you give it on my pile of scripts to read, I hope you have your resume ready because you're fired. Because that's not what we're doing anymore. Because if you just think about it, how many TV shows are there? How many shows are you able to watch? You know, what's your, even during a pandemic, I still can't keep up with everything that I wanted to be seen. Um, there's just too much content, way too much content. And it used to be the most people who watch the show, you will be successful. So everyone was going for comfort food. Let's take a familiar trope, put a twist on it, get a star. And there's not that many channels out there. And it's, everyone just wants comfort food. Not anymore. Now there's just a, baz you know, a bazillion distribution channels. The internet disrupted everything. And the way TV shows succeed or fail is follow through. So it's not the number of people watching. The metric is what percentage of people who watch the first episode watch all the episodes. And if that number is not high, they cancel the show and it's hard to get, that writer loses a lot of credibility. If that number is high, that's, that's what is the golden swan that everyone's chasing. So then you start just thinking to yourself, what shows do I keep watching? Um, they're interesting, they're funny, they're dramatic. Yes, yes, sure. But they also, you have a personal connection to it somehow. Somehow the show resonates and just matters enough that you're gonna watch it. And so they need writers who can do that. So that, that would be the first main piece of advice, which is you know most of the books and the seminars um, and a lot of what's being taught out there is outdated and will lead you to failure. 
And that, well, that reminds me of a, I think a common reaction that people have, um, whether they're reading a book or watching TV or watching movies and, you know, eight times out of 10, Oh, if this got on TV, I could definitely do that. Now there's right. something I just don't like about that idea of like, I'm going to set my ambitions based on what will pass the lowest common threshold, <laughs> but I, it, but maybe you have a little context to offer to people about it's not yeah. writers who perform at that level who are getting who are getting those jobs, right? Well, so there's it's, a couple of things. So, so first off, a lot of the times those not very good TV shows or movies actually have phenomenal scripts to start with. But there's a development process, and there's a lot of things that can derail it. So that's number one. Number two, sometimes they are terrible scripts to start with. But you know, if you are a Netflix or an NBC, you have a bunch of slots that you got to fill. Um, and you're looking for something very specific and sometimes you just grab it and go. And the thing you have to understand in TV is sometimes they're working under such compressed head deadlines that they don't have the ability to create the greatest stories. What they can do is create the best possible story in this very limited amount of time. And they're just cranking it out. The thing that people have to understand is that's not your competition. Your competition is everybody who wants to be publishing a novel. It's everybody who wants to be publishing or getting into TV or feature writing. That huge pool of people is your competition. And you have to be at the very top of that competition to get noticed. So I train writers to write at a level that is much higher than a lot of network or other shows so that they can break into the business and then perhaps be offered a lot of money to work on one of the shows. And then they have a decision if they want to do that or not. But um, yeah, and this is really good news though, actually, Don, because if the benchmark was your standard multiplex movie or your sort of standard network show, then a lot more people could hit that standard, which mm -hmm. a lot of aspiring writers would be, that's great. But is it? Just think then it becomes way more luck, right? It, I, I think it becomes probably way more connections mm. and, and, and or luck, which to me is then I don't, I don't want to compete that way. Whereas now it's about skill. I mean, connections and luck certainly have a, a role, but it's mainly skill. I mean, I know... Um, I know someone who is a lit agent at a major agency that wants to be a writer can get anyone to read their script and has been doing this for 10 years and still is an agent and not a writer because their writing is not quite strong enough. They have all the access in the world. Um, let me say one more thing um, because I think this is important and it comes to this. By definition, when anyone sells a piece of material, it's the first thing they ever wrote. They'll just say that. It's never, it's never true, but it makes for great PR. And then what happens is it makes people think, oh, if you have the ability to do this, you, you'll know very soon. And if I've tried it a few times and I haven't had success, I guess I don't have what it takes. Just understand that you know, my official story is that I wrote one script, and then launched my career very early on with Ridley Scott. Not entire, that's my PR story, it's not the actual truth. Um, and I know a lot of writers who, I was a waitress, I decided to write, I wrote over the weekend and I sold the script. It's a great story. It's not true. It's never ever true. So, um, because then that starts to think it's just all luck or it's all random or it's all you're just born with it or you're not. No, this is, as you know, um, Talent is repeatable skills. That's what this is. It's repeatable skills. You can be born with them. You can just absorb them through life or you can consciously train yourself or be trained to. doesn't matter where they come from. And so the game is to grow your talent and to grow your talent. That's the key. Well, maybe we should throw a plug here. There's one thing that you recommended to us before we started your class, a book that we read. And um, I, I had already read it, but why don't you tell you go, people you what do. it is? Uh, well, I'm blanking on the title. So. Uh, the book is, okay, the book is Mindset. 
Mindset. And it's by That's Carol it. Dweck. And I do not get any royalties or affiliate marketing. I just have people read this book because it talks about the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. And the fixed mindset is if you want to be a writer, you have that talent or you don't. And the growth mindset is if you want to be a uh, writer, you grow that talent. And it's really profound because the fixed mindset craves an outcome. So when I write something and I give it to you, Don, for feedback, the fixed mindset wants you to love it. And if you don't, the fixed mindset is really upset and it'll throw a temper tantrum. And it'll either say, well, what's wrong with you, Don, that you are so shallow that you can't see the amazingness of my writing or Oh, yeah, what's wrong with me? Why do I think I can be a writer? And the growth mindset does not crave an outcome. It craves the truth. Because if I write something and I love it, and you don't love it, why not? Not like, why not? But why not? And are you seeing what I'm seeing? Have I done my job of, it, of are you fully experiencing what I'm experiencing and don't love it? Or are you not experiencing what I'm experiencing? And if you're not experiencing what I'm experiencing, why not? What are you experiencing? And why is that different from what I'm experiencing? And what weakness in my writing is allowing that to happen? And how can I learn to write in a way where what I'm experiencing can translate to what you're experiencing? And further, how can I grow my writing to what I'm experiencing is even more compelling? And then how can I get you to experience that? And the growth mindset will lead you there. If you have the right training, the fixed mindset will just keep you fixed in place, which is just keep doing the same thing over and over, hoping for a different outcome. Well, it always reminds me of one of my favorite movies, uh, David Mamet film, The Edge. They're fighting a bear and Anthony Hopkins is trying to get Alec Baldwin to like get out of his defeated state and fight the bear. And what one man can do, another can do. Mm -hmm. It's that idea of these are skill sets that human beings can have the ability to develop clearly. So I just need to go through the process that a person has to do versus this kind of, you know, navel gazing of do I have the magic or not? Right. And to avoid the in massive industry out there of, you have what it takes, we'll teach you the magic formula, or we'll teach you the magic cover letter, or we'll teach you, or, or we will help you get your writing in front of these people. Um, that all must be avoided. Uh, it, it has to be, how do I become a better writer? I, I teach, or I go up and speak at the Toronto Screenwriting Conference, which is this amazing conference. They bring up Academy Award-winning writers and top showrunners. And what I always find amazing is, so I go up and I, I present. Um, and then part of the reason I go up there is that when I'm done, I run around and, you know, when I'm not presenting, I listen to everyone else. And I learn so much because, you know, here's an executive, here's a showrunner, here's a writing. And, but the, the Academy Award winning writers and like top showrunners in the business, I see them do the same thing. They run around. Now these people, they're top of the mountain. And yet, you know, instead of going out to lunch or enjoying Toronto or getting a massage or going golfing or getting an early flight home, they are sitting in on everyone else's. And it's a big, dark theater. No one sees them. No one knows they're there. And it's like, why are they doing it? Because they're trying to learn something. They're, tr they're trying to become even better. And, and I realize that's why they are great writers. You know, because every day you're becoming better as a writer or you're not. And I guarantee you that some of your competition is getting better today. So then the question is, are you keeping up? Yeah, so we only have a few minutes left and I definitely wanted to spend a few minutes on um, your course and the, I, I know you always have waiting lists so you're not desperate for new people, but I'm desperate for anybody who wants to learn how to write to know about this. So can you talk a little bit about like what's actually available for somebody who hears this and wants to learn yeah. what you have to teach? So you can go to the website, which is coreymandel.net and uh, offering the professional screenwriting TV writing workshop where we really start the creative integration process. And we also learn about clarity and essential context and organic escalations. And we do intuitive training, we do conceptual training. Um, and so 
in a normal world, we offer them live uh, in Santa Monica, and but we also offer them online. Right now, everything is online. And uh, we do it on Zoom, and uh, where we can all see and hear each other. And um, I co-teach them with Talton, who's an Academy Award, not Academy Award, I'm sorry, uh, not yet, an award-winning, <laughs> I just made him Academy Award-winning, he would appreciate that, an award-winning screenwriter and just a great teacher. Um, and you'll, you'll be with me like six weeks and him with two weeks. Yeah, and, let me just say, because uh, some, you know, if people get really sold on you, that might make them nervous. And I was a little bit nervous too, as I guess he just pawning us off. But one of the really interesting things is Tolson comes from the other side. Like, so you said you're conceptual naturally, and he was an intuitive naturally. And having people who kind of came from those different backgrounds, I think in the end was just one of the huge benefits of it is that we were getting people who had mastered a skill set that was foreign to them on both sides of it. And, and, and he's just a delightful guy. So uh, yeah, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. And um, so uh, the, the, you know, the current round sold out, the next round sold out, we'll have, we have some spots in June and then we're starting to fill September. So they tend to go four times a year, like, January, March, or April, June, and uh, September. But if you go to the website, or you can email my assistant, Jared, at assistant at coreymandel.net, and he can get you um, all the info. We're like running multiple sessions at a time, like weekdays, weeknights, Saturdays. Um, so there's different time slots, but um, I'm not exactly sure how many spots are left in June, but Jared would know at assistant at coreymandel.net. Well, uh, yeah, thanks for coming on. I think the work you do is so important. A, for those of us who want to be writers, but B, for the people who want to consume stories. And I mean, maybe we can end on that. Why, do you, why for you personally is it important that people be producing stories that uh, we'll eventually see on the screen? I believe that this past year was crazy. You know, the, the pandemic and, and just it's multifaceted impacts on society. And I'm very much hopeful that, you know, we're in the beginning or middle of the end phase and that this is going to be behind us in the not too distant future. No guarantees, but that's certainly our hope. I fear that when the pandemic ends, it's gonna get more dangerous. Um, I think the rise of nationalism, the, the divisions, and I think um, just how everyone is so disconnected from everyone and everyone's in their silo and everyone thinks they're right and the other side is an idiot. It's not sustainable. And we can think of a lot of parallels and we can think of, you know, the last great pandemic was 1918. And, um, and when it ended, there was great economic prosperity in the Roaring Twenties, which I think we might be seeing. And, and I look forward to enjoying our version of the Roaring Twenties. But we know what comes next. We know comes the rise of fascism and nationalism, um, genocide, Holocaust, World War II, uh, depression. And there are a lot of people who think we could be headed toward that if we're not super careful. So how do we talk to other people? How do we bring people together? Um, it, it, it used to be through schools, but that's not the case. It used to be through our politics, that's not the case. Uh, it used to be through religion, that's not really the case. It used to be in America, it used to be in our neighborhoods because we would live with people who were different from us and thought different from us. And that's not really true anymore either. We, we've realigned our, right? I mean, where I live, you know, 97% of the people look like me and think like me for the most part. Um, I think that really one of the only areas left are stories. And stories are something that we all can experience. And it, stories give us the ability to understand and empathize and to viscerally connect with ideas and people that we are so separate from. I mean, I found No Man Land so powerful. And, um, you know, it's like, I know there are people who are marginalized. I know there are people who are lost and are disconnected. And I know that they can find a charismatic leader online. 
and to need to feel connected and belonging. I know all that intellectually, but for that, I, that hour and a half, I felt like it was me going through that experience. And I can't even quite put into words the impact it had, but it was, it was really impactful. And it's made me kind of understand things and feel differently towards other people. More understanding, more compassionate, even, even the people who maybe found a not so loving charismatic leader and ended up charging into the capital or whatever they did. And I'm not trying to turn this into a political thing. I'm just saying it, it helped me sort of soften up and stop seeing certain people as enemies and started seeing certain people as people and at least starting to get some understanding of maybe what they were feeling and what drove them to do things, some, some kind of empathy. And if we can all do that, it might be absolutely requisite for the survival of our species. <laughs> I mean, the way I, I look at it, and this might be overly dramatic, Don, but I look at it like during the pandemic, the scientists were spending 24 seven trying to come up with vaccines. And they, didn't, they knew that their vaccine might not work, might not cross the finish line. But if, if there's 500 people trying to create vaccines, we just need a few of them or one of them to cross the finish line. Well, I've been telling everyone, if you're not a scientist and you're not an immunologist or a biologist and you're a writer, then you've got to be writing and it's like creating a vaccine. Not all of your stories are going to cross the finish line and get made, but we're going to need stories more than ever. I mean, even if it's just an entertaining story, like if large groups of people who don't normally socialize can all watch the same thing and be entertained by it, that helps bring people together. But especially if it's something where we can experience people and we can, experience, we can just walk in someone else's shoes. I, I honestly believe that it's the last thing keeping humanity intact. So that's the main reason I teach. I, I feel, and, and maybe this is absurd, but I, I literally feel like it's our job to, in whatever way we can, make the world a better place that when we leave it than when we came into it. And, and everyone has a different way of doing that. And the people who created the vaccines certainly have done that. Um, and I feel like if you're a writer, then that's your way to do it. And I'm, for many reasons that we don't need to get into, I'm not a writer anymore, but I am a writing teacher. And so I feel like that's the way I'm working to make the world a better place is trying to help if in any way that I can help writers improve so they can tell stronger stories. And also what I really wanna do is help people who maybe have a very unique perspective to, and don't have access to maybe the training that other people do. I, I, want, as, I want as much diversity of stories as possible. So that's why I do it. And I think that anyone who's writing, I mean, I certainly get wanting to have success in a career and money and ego. I mean, I was a screenwriter for 10 years. Trust me, I get all that. Um, and, I, and I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with that. But I would also say there can be a greater noble calling to it. And, uh, and if you can hear that calling, um, embrace it. Because we, we are going to need stories more than ever. I, I think it's our last hope. Well, Corey, a sincere thanks for everything you've done for me and for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. And uh, I hope other people look into your work. Thanks for having me. And it's great to see you. Yeah, you too. All right. Take right, care. Take care.